It's nice to see you tonight and I'm glad to be with you. As was announced already, we're discussing the subject tonight, the first church. A lot of people have never heard a sermon about the New Testament church. As a basis for this study, I'm reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, begin with verse 13. Matthew 16, 13 beginning. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He says unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell, or Hades, shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. That's the reading of Matthew 16. 13 through 19 that will serve as a springboard for our study tonight. I want to talk to you basically about four things. I want to talk to you first of all about the, the first church was not some things. Then I'm going to talk to you about some things the church was. And thirdly, some things that the first church did not have. And then fourthly, some things that the first church had. That's the outline for our study tonight. Now, when you begin to talk about the first church, you're talking about the church I just read about. Where Jesus said, I will build, build what? My church. That's not mine now, nor yours, but his. The first church was not some things. By understanding what a thing is not, we're in a better position to understand what a thing is. Do you like that approach? I think it's a good way to look at it. Okay? The first church was not the Roman Catholic Church, even though they claim to be the first church. Do you know that? They have some ads out right now on television wherein they claim to be the first church that started in Acts chapter 2. And that they even are producers of the Bible. That's not true. Even during the Dark Ages, they tried to destroy the Bible. There's evidence of that. And yet many people think that's true. The first major pope was not established until 606 A.D., Boniface III. 600 years later, after the Lord said, I will build my church. So the first church was not the Roman Catholic Church. You need to read, never read about that in this book. But secondly, the first church was not a human denomination. The word denomination means a division of. If I were to give you a $5 bill and say, give me divisions of that, you could give me five ones, you see. And so the word denomination means a division of something. So the church of Christ, the one that Jesus and I will build, is not a division of anything. It's the Lord's body. Colossians 1.18, he's the head of the body of the church. Colossians 1.24, Christ is the savior of that body, the church. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. So the first church was not a denomination. Now, some people have made it such by the kinds of things they've gotten the church involved in. 
But the church that I read about in this book, that Jesus said, I will build, the first church, is not a denomination. And it must not be. Also, the first church is not a political organization. God has ordained government separate from the church. Like you read in the book of Romans in chapter 13, in the first seven verses, he said, let every soul be subject unto the higher power. That's the government. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. We may not always like the men that are in power, but we need to respect the office. And as Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, pray for kings and for all that in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Yet at the same time, the first church is not a political body and must stay separate from such. As you catalog some things, the first church was not. The first church was not a social club. A lot of places today, even churches of Christ, have become a playhouse. Maybe you have entertained some of that. They're like a glorified country club with fun and frolic as their main agenda. You never read about the church that the, in this book, the one that Jesus said I will build, providing for or engaging in social activities. In fact, when Paul wrote the Romans in Romans 14 and verse 17, he said this, for the kingdom. Many times the word kingdom and church are the same, right? Not always, but many times. So the church is not, not what? Meat and drink. See that? Some people said, I thought it was. No, it's not that. But it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's Romans 14, verse 17. So th those are some things that the first church was not. Maybe there's some others you could think of. In the second place, let's think a little bit about the first church was. Was some things. First, the first church was and is today the church of Christ. Do you know that? The Bible never refers to the church as a church, but the church. Like Acts 8, Saul made havoc of the church. The church, which identifies the first church. In Romans 16 and 16, Paul ran the Romans said, the churches of Christ salute you. That identifies the first church. But somebody said, that's churches, plural. I know. He's not talking about different denominations because none of them were in existence at that time. The first major denomination the Lutheran Church did not become effective under 1530, 1500 years after the time we're reading about when Jesus said, I will build my church. 1500 years. And so we know he's not talking about those religious bodies. Well, somebody said, why do you say churches of Christ? Okay. Suppose in this city that there are 10 churches of Christ. How would you say it? There are 10 Churches of Christ in this city, right? Put an S on it. But suppose nine of them go out of business and you just got one left. Then how would you say it? You got it. The Church of Christ in this city. That's where it's used in Romans 16, 60. Just talking about the different Churches of Christ in different locations. Just like the seven churches of Asia. They were not different groups. They were just in different cities. When you think about, in John 15, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. There are those who say those branches are all these religious bodies. The context won't allow that. He's talking about an individual. If a man abide in me. A man's not the church, is he? And so you can begin to see that the first church was the church of Christ. And in Ephesians 5.23, Paul indicated that Christ is the Savior. Savior what? The church. 
identified it as the Lord's church. The first church was one in number, not two. Paul taught the Ephesians in Ephesians 4.4. 4, there is one body. You have to underscore that in your Bible. How many bodies? One. I would be insulting your intelligence if I thought you didn't know how many one was. So I'm not going to try to explain it. All of you know that, don't you? One body. Not two. Now what is that one body? There are several definitions given. I like Colossians 1.24 which says for his body's sake watch it now, which is which is what Paul? The church. No finer definition than that. And so you can begin to see that's exactly what he's talking about. When Jesus prayed his prayers in John 17, by the way, in John 17, 21, his prayer was that we might be one, not divided into all these different religious bodies as religious division is condemned throughout the entire Bible. Also, the first church was in the mind of God from eternity. You know, we're told by some people today that the Lord really intended to establish the kingdom. But because of Jewish rejection, he changed his mind on the spur of the moment and said, well, I'll just build the church and later establish the kingdom. That just one thing wrong with that. It's just not so. When you read in the book of Ephesians 3, 10 and 11, God purchased a purpose the church from eternity. You know what that means? That is, he had the church in mind all along. Not an afterthought. He planned it. And when you read the prophets, like Isaiah 2, Michael 4, Daniel 2, 44, Daniel 7, 13, 14, and other places, you read about those prophets prophesying the establishment of the Lord's church, which shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that God had the church in mind from the beginning. And so the first church was in the mind of God all along. The third thing I want to talk to you about, the first church did not have some things. By studying some things the first church did not have, we can better get a hat <clears throat> on some things that it did have. <clears throat> what are some of the things that the first church did not have? First, didn't have any reverence. You ever read about any of the apostles being Reverend John, Peter, or Paul? No, just Peter, James, and John. I expect if you looked around this town, you'd find a lot of signs where the preachers are called Reverend, do you think? Some of them are not happy with that. They won't be called right Reverend. Or Monsignor, or some other title. You know the word Reverend's only found one time in the entire Bible. In Psalm 111 and verse 9. Not talking about a man. I'm talking about God. Holy and reverent is his name. No man has ever been called reverend. And so the first church did not have any reverence in it. When you come to Matthew 23. Beginning with verse 8 through 9. He talks about not being called different things. And in the process, don't be called father. Somebody said, well, you called your dad that, don't you? Yeah. You know why we do that? Because Paul did that and when he talked about the child-father relationship. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Fathers, provoke not your children around. Ephesians 4, 1 to 4. That's scriptural. But in Matthew 23, when he said, call no man your father, he's not talking about a child-father relationship, but in a religious sense. Call no man your father upon the earth. I like what Job said about it. In the book of Job chapter 32 verse 21 and 22 you know what he said? Let me not let me not what? I pray you accept any man's person. Listen to this part of it. Neither let me give flattering titles unto man. For I know 
that if I give flattering titles, my maker would soon take me away. Have you encountered that passage before? It's in the book of Job 32, verses 21 and 22. And so the first church did not, did not have any reverence in it. And we must not have, have any today. Okay? But as you think about some things that the first church did not have, the first church did not have nor use mechanical instrumental music in its worship. Mechanical instruments of music were used in the Old Testament. And the reason for that was <clears throat> God commanded that two times. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 25, it was a commandment of the Lord. In Psalm 81, 1 to 4, a commandment of God. That's the reason they used them in the Old Testament. We don't live on the Old Testament. It was nailed to his cross. Colossians 2, 14. We're discharged from that old law. Romans 7 and 6. No longer under that law. And so you can't go back and try to bind things of the law of Moses on the New Testament church. Now, since the law has been changed, as a, a priesthood has been changed, there's a necessity, a change in the law. Hebrews 7 and verse 12 says, Will it tonight? Do not live under the Mosaic law. We live under the law of Christ, right? In Galatians 6 and 2, Paul said, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill. Fulfill what, Paul? The law of Christ. That's the law we live under today. And that law teaches us ten times in the New Testament, ten times, to see. Are you aware that there are ten scriptures in the New Testament that tell us to sing? Matthew 26, 30. When they sung a hymn, they went out. Mark 14, 26. Same passage. Sung a hymn, they went out. Acts 16, 25 at midnight. Paul and Silas were singing. Remember that? Romans 15, 9. Among the Gentiles will I sing. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Sing with the Spirit and the understanding also. Sing with. <clears throat> and that's the only scripture that ever says anything about singing with something. And that's with the spirit <clears throat> and understanding. Ephesians 5.19, which a lot of people are familiar with, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, make a the heart to the Lord. Colossians 3.16, sing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Hebrews 2.12, in the midst of the church will I sing thy praise. Hebrews 13.15, Talk about the fruit of the lips. And one more. James 5.13. Is any among you Mary? Let him on. Sing. All ten of those scriptures in the New Testament. Authorize singing. There is no authority, not one ounce of it, to use a mechanical instrument of music in the New Testament worship. And so the first church did not have mechanical instruments of music. That's what we don't have today. Likewise, the first church did not have any human institutions through which it did its work. Every church of Christ in New Testament days was independent with its own elders, deacons, and members called saints. Philippians 1.1 1, 1. In Acts 14.23 they appointed elders in every church. Titus 1, 5. Elders in every city. That is every city where the church was. When you read in the New Testament about the work of the church, like Acts 6, when the widows had been neglected and they appointed seven men of the local church to take care of that business. Whenever a church wanted to do evangelistic work, it supported the local preacher, like Paul said, he took wages to do them service. 2 Corinthians 11 8. And when a church helped a preacher in a distant place, they didn't send through some human organization. They sent it directly to the preacher in the field. You read about that in the book of Acts 11, 27 to 30, Philippians chapter 4, 15 to 16. When they helped somebody in need in a distant place, 
They didn't send it through some benevolent society, but directed to the elders of the needy churches. That's Acts 11, 27 to 30. So the first church did not have human institutions through which he did his work. Pretty simple, isn't it? One more point, and the sermon's yours. The first church had some things. We looked at was not, was, did not have, and what it had. Now, the first church had elders in every church. That, they got away from that, but, but maybe having one man over a large area, and it just kept growing until finally they appointed one man to be the head of the church on earth in the form of the Pope. That's how, do you know the Roman Catholic Church started from the eldership of the Church of Christ? That's hard to believe, isn't it? That's exactly where it started, but not respecting the authority of the elders, and they could only tend the flock of God among them. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2. So the first church had elders in every church with deacons and members. Also, the first church had Christ as its head. Somebody's got to head it up. Otherwise, you're going to have chaos. In Ephesians 1, 22-23, you remember he pointed out that he put all things on the feet of Christ, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Colossians 1, 18, Christ is the head of the body, the church. Colossians 1, 24, same thing. Now, head directs the body, right? Your head directs your body. And when it quits doing that, you got problems. And uh, Christ is the head of the body, the church is the body, and the church can only do and be and operate as the head gives direction. Otherwise, we got problems. And that's one reason that some churches of Christ have so many problems, do so many things that are unscriptural and unauthorized, is because they fail to listen to the head. Their problem. The headquarters of the Church of Christ. We do have headquarters. Did you know that? Oh, it's not on the earth. It's where the head is. That's where Christ is. Sitting on the right hand of God. The first church also had one means of raising funds to do its work. Just one. Today you find a lot of people engaged in all kinds of things. Rifling car washes, sales, begging people out in the community for money. The first church raised its funds by its members, you know, don't you, by laying by in store on the first day of the week as prosper. 1 Corinthians 16 and in verse 2. And we're to give bountifully as purposed in our hearts. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. The Lord also said in Acts 20, 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. you believe that? Suppose we said tonight we're going to line everybody up. On this side, we're going to put the people who want to be on the receiving end. And on this side, we're going to put the people on that side who is in the giving side. Which side are you going to get on? Think about it. It's more blessed to give than to receive. you believe that? A good scripture I encourage you to memorize when he says these kinds of things. Luke 6 38, a great passage. It says this Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and running over, shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that ye met, it shall be measured to you again. You know what that means? God gives on the same basis as I give. <coughs> Think about that. So the first church only had one means of raising funds to do its work. Also, the first church had gospel preaching as its primary mission. We're getting away from that in a lot of places. Gospel preaching has been relegated to the back seat and the back, back burner in so many places. The primary work of the church is to preach the gospel. That's its mission. It's the pillar and the ground of the truth. First Timothy 3 and verse 15. 
The work of a gospel preacher is found in three words. 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. That's it. And we're getting away from that. Preachers are preaching everything except the word. They're preaching their thoughts and ideals, and it seems to me, and I think, it don't make any difference what I think, nor what you think either. The only thing that really matters is what saith the scripture, right? <coughs> Romans 4, 3. What's the Bible say about it? Every time we study, every time we put a sermon together, or a Bible class material, what does the Bible say about it? Got to get back to that. If we want to keep the church pure as God intended. The church of Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 sounded out the word. That's gospel preaching. And of course the other works is have a limited benevolence among needy saints and building up the local church. That's called edification. That's the work of the church. And we must not add nor take from it. Also, the first church had the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Somebody said, it doesn't say every first day. Don't have to. Don't have to. Remember when he said in Exodus 20 and verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? You know, he didn't say remember every Sabbath. Ever wonder why? The Jews knew that every week had a Saturday. Didn't, right? Came every, Saturday, every week. And Christians knew that the first day of the week comes every week. And they met on the first day of the week to break bread, Acts 20 and verse 7. How often do you remember your birthday? Well, until you get to be about 40, about once a year, right? Why not twice a year? Don't come twice a year. I saw a sign at a restaurant that said, the Lions Club meets here Tuesday at 6.30. Why didn't you say every Tuesday? The Lions know every week has a Tuesday. I well, don't have to say that. And so when the Lord said they met on the first day of the week, by apostolic approved example, they met every first day. There are people today that meet all kinds of time. There's one group that meets once a year, the Jehovah's Witnesses, because the Passover, they think, it's once a year, of course, and they will observe the Passover when the Lord's Supper was instituted. Some every six months, some quarterly. Some monthly, I ran into a group down in eastern Kentucky that met every other Sunday took it. And then there are people that take it on the first day of the week, like the Bible teaches. So the first church had the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. One more point in the sermon is yours. The first church taught and practiced the Lord's plan of salvation. But get away from that. I hear preachers put together a good sermon and don't even extend the invitation. Why do you need to extend that invitation? People need to know what to do. Suppose some, you preach a good sermon and you got a visitor, never been in service before, and he decides, I want to do what the Bible says. He comes up here and he don't know what to do. He hasn't told him. The plan of salvation needs to be taught. Every service, don't it? To hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17. Believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son. John 8, 24, or die in your sins. Repentance is required of all men everywhere. Acts 17, 30. The confession must be made, and it's a simple one. Like the eunuch said in Acts 8, 37, I believe. Believe what? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the confession that must be made. In those words. Sometimes I hear it not done that way. I hear the preacher may say, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And the fellow may say, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that making that confession? Mm-hmm. Think about that. The eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. That was taught in New Testament days. Every case of conversion, the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 2 through 19, involved Men hearing, believing, and obeying the gospel. And the church today that claims to be the church of Christ need these things, right? Without addition or subtraction. Thanks for listening so well. But should you be in this audience and you need to make response, we stand ready to help you. Daniel's here to help you make the good confession, to baptize you. You need to be restored. 
Now repentance, confession, prayer. We invite you to come while we sing.